I guess AXIS as an organisation, we started out, if you, if you take it back to um, austerity years, um, so there was a lot of focus on cutting back local government spend, um, and a lot of that local government spend was supporting charities and social enterprises in areas at that point in time, so 2011 onwards. A lot of that spend was delivered through contracts where you know, the local authority would partner with a local charity and say, can you do this service for us, we'll pay you to do that. We went through a period of austerity where central government was looking to, to cut back a lot of that spending. That cascaded down to local government and that basically cascaded down to individual charities and social enterprises seeing their income streams completely cut off. At that point, there was an opportunity, an opportunity you can say, or there was a challenge that was faced by those organisations. In order to stay afloat and still support the most vulnerable people in society, but your income's completely dried up, what, what have you got to do? Um, and that was, I guess, where some organisations saw an opportunity to start innovating and say, okay, right, where else can we derive income from um, so that we can still do the activities that we know can change communities for the better, but we're not so reliant on funders to come through or local government, central government for that. Um, and so from what I've seen over, over my time at Access, is there's definitely been a, a shift in that mentality where even once funding has started to flow again a little bit more from local government, um, there's a realisation that actually you might be in more control of your destiny if, if you can, you know, if you have an idea that can generate its own income um, and that can support your, your business idea, but then you can, do, you can deliver the good um, through the income that's generated. So I guess briefly that's how I'd say, you know, the opportunity is there to basically help organisations be more resilient. So, you know, if you want to, if you've got an idea about how you can increase impact in communities, um, that's great. Chances are there's going to be some headwinds and some tailwinds on those journeys. Um, and social enterprise is, is a mechanism by which to actually start increasing the agility of an organisation to say, okay, right, where else can I derive some income from? Um, maybe I need to have fingers in multiple pies, to kind of say. Um, so that, that's, I guess, the opportunity. The landscape's going to evolve. Um, right now, the central government, we kind of don't quite know how things are going to play out. Um, there's echoes of potentially another round of austerity, and what does that mean for organisations? Um, and ultimately, is the communities that we're looking to serve, to help, to support. Um, how do we make sure those activities don't get stopped because the funding isn't coming from the right place? Um, and so social enterprise provides an opportunity to say, right, okay, we're not so dependent on one income source. We, we start thinking about you know, looking to sell direct to consumers, looking to sell direct to local businesses, looking to um, find other ways of generating revenue um, rather than just a single source. So I guess from that, from the perspective of us as an organisation, that's what we try and encourage, we try and say, look, try and look at diversifying your income stream because you never know where one, one part might dry up. Um, Ed, I don't know what, what, what you think about the opportunities for social enterprise? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I completely agree with that last comment and about diversifying um, your income stream, you know, not having eggs in all one basket, I think is a, is a, is a different way of saying the same thing. Um, I suppose when I think about the opportunity for social enterprise, I, I, I start maybe with two questions and possibly there's a third that leads on from that. So question one for me is, are there problems in the world that need solving? Um, and I think probably that's fairly easy. <laughs> There are a lot of problems in the world that need solving at the local or the global level. Um, big ones might be inequality or climate change, and underneath that, there's going to be a ton of other problems. So <coughs> the answer, I think, to that question is yes. So therefore, there is a role for 
organisations that are seeking to solve challenges or, or problems. And then, and then the second question I might ask myself is, given that, and given that social enterprise, the, the operative word being enterprise, needs to trade, is there a market? Is, is there a place that an enterprise that is trying to solve the problem of some description can have a customer and therefore someone's going to buy something uh, and therefore that there is a viable model? And, and going to Andy's sort of comment about sort of not having eggs in one basket, I would then subdivide that, is there a market, is there a buyer, is there a customer into will government buy, will businesses buy, or will consumers buy, or any of the, any of the above. And potentially in the social enterprise world, well, is there subsidy or grant funding available as well, a sort of portfolio of income streams. And I think just briefly on those, I think government will buy, whether that's at a central or local level. I think there's some really interesting work that Black South West Network is doing to sort of disrupt the uh, way that procurement or buying works um, with governmental agencies. That can extend to universities, it can extend to hospital trusts. I think businesses will also buy because actually increasingly it's seen as a good way of doing business. Business originally was constructed as a, uh, I think, a social utility, broadly speaking. Um, but now, if businesses want to hire the brightest and the best, they have to, I think, be seen to be doing the right thing. Will consumers buy? Well, again, I think there is a, a growing social conscience amongst individual buyers that actually they want to buy well. They don't want to trash the planet. They don't want to necessarily exacerbate the problems. So there should be a market in that case. And then just so sort of briefly to, to, con to conclude my third possible question, depending, uh, interesting to perhaps know a little bit about you know, who's come today. Um, if people are thinking about either setting up a social enterprise or already have one and want to grow it, for me, the question is, is there a passion to solve those problems with a business model? Because if the passion isn't there, I would suggest this isn't an easy territory to tackle. I think it needs perseverance, it needs a lot of grit, um, and it needs a lot, of, a lot of help from a lot of different people. But I think with that passion, it's, it's easy to un overcome these challenges. Without it, probably it's going to be a three-year, maybe five-year maximum uh, venture that may lead back to something more traditional. So, that's the opportunity, but I don't think it's easy. Okay. Um, before I go around the room and ask the individuals here where, where they are, I've just got the supplementary questions. Um, why do we need social investors if there is a big market and there's potential and you know diverse, like, just diversification, in, in, you know, sort of uh, in potential income streams, talent? Why do we need social investors? Um, so, as I said, we, we are a community interest company. So I've often in the past, in, in sort of setting that up and growing it, found myself on the other side of the table where I'm seeking investment for what we want to do or things that we want to do. Um, and and I, I think my experience is that we, the reason for social investment is because actually sometimes there, you, you fall between two gaps. So. You might say, why not just grant fund everything? Why not? Why not just you know there, there should be grant making trusts or foundations. There should be governmental agencies that can grant. Well, the, the, there are two potential arguments against that. One is there's not enough of it. The demand for grant significantly exceeds the supply of it in general terms. And B, it's a sort of one hit wonder. The grant often comes once and that's it. So in other words, you can't recycle it. I, I think the other, the other then, so that's one end of the spectrum, which is the sort of, let's say, very soft governmental. The, the other end of the spectrum then is the existing financial markets. And they might fall into, and I'm gonna oversimplify here, banks and private equity. Banks often, not always, would be very risk averse. And therefore, if, you're, if you don't have security to offer, if you don't have a long, standard track record, or if you don't have the right people with the right track record, banks won't necessarily want to know. Not always, but often. And then I think if you go down the other 
private sector route, which would be perhaps more akin to what's called private equity. That's organisations that are willing to take risk, not necessarily wanting security. I, th I think the, that market is often, not always again, short-termist and requiring a very, very high level of returns. Returns that maybe some or very few social enterprises can sustain, but not many. Therefore, I think the role that social investment should play is to say, actually, we're going to be longer term and perhaps less requiring a, a, a big multiplier on our returns of private equity. We're going to be less risk averse than the banks and we're going to be able to revolve things and provide a greater quantum of money than grant funding might. That, that would be my view. Yeah, I guess I would I would add that and, and reflect on a conversation that myself and Ed and uh, say were having earlier actually. Um, that money equals power. Um, and so we talk about social investment, bringing back to social enterprise. Invest money equals power. It gives entrepreneurs, enterprises the power to grow, to scale their idea, to potentially enter a market. Um, to potentially try an idea for the first time if they didn't have the capital to do it otherwise. So money gives power. Um, and so then to take it back a step is to say, well, okay, well, what is the motivations for the person that's providing the money? And that's where the social investor makes a difference to when you go to a commercial market. It's, it's the, the motivations as to why they're providing the money because to some extent there is power. There is always that power imbalance. Um, and I think, you know, as, as much as you know, the system needs to change over time, for now we're stuck in a system where money brings power, and so the person providing the money has the power in that relationship. Um, and so it's highlighting, you know, there are, there are some cases where if you're a social enterprise or a social entrepreneur, you can go to the mainstream markets, um, but you'll be acknowledging that the power is then held by the bank, the venture capital firm. Um, the power is now held, in this instance, by a social investor. But the whole purpose of the social investor is enshrined in their, their being. And I think that's, that for me is the, the value of why we need social investors. Because they're willing to provide the money, and they're willing to provide the power in a more equitable way for the right motivations. Um, and that, that's the value that they bring to the system. Thank you. Um, you start from the left and, and move around, maybe introduce uh, yourself to the panel and um, if you've got an enterprise, you know, what stage it's at, what you, what you, or if you're thinking of a, a new enterprise, you know, um, uh, and give an insight into uh, what you see as the challenges in terms of raising finance or, or investment, uh, where you are now, yeah. Me and my friends, we are now currently students in University of Bristol and we are all from the innovation center, but we are not the same major. I'm in social innovation and entrepreneurship, and she's in creative innovation and entrepreneurship. So <clears throat> um, basically, for me, myself, I'm new in this area, not really, really mm, clear what social enterprise and social innovation are doing. Um, but um, during our talk, we've discussed about <clears throat> the things between social innovation and social, uh, social enterprise and the business, the real business one. Um, so I, I found that it's really interesting because in my opinion, um, a lot of uh, companies in China, because I'm from China, Mm, a lot of companies in China are already doing things that are that's that's focusing on social impact and to do things to change the world. Um, but they're actually business one. They're not they're not social enterprise. So mm, well, I'm still exploring. So um, really help. It's really helpful to listen to all those investments and other stuff in this area. Thank you so much. 
Oh, hi, uh, I'm the creative innovation and entrepreneur student and I heard uh, from this one from my friends. So um, I'm always interested in this kind of topic because I think uh, the ethical <coughs> companies uh, are very important. Um, some companies, I think especially the major companies, when they uh, gain enough profits, uh, they will do some charities to gain a reputation. But I think it's really a good thing to do it because it can help more people. Um, but I'm not, I'm not new too, so I'm very confused about the pro, uh, prototyping a business model. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm here to uh, listen to what you did at the first. I think it's very helpful. Thank you very much. <coughs> Um, my name is um, Angela Ludbridge, I'm founder of Better Together on My Safety um, and I help um, parents and carers to keep their children safe online. Um, for those with uh, younger children, I um, run workshops to signpost them to practical online um, safety uh, tools, techniques and resources. Um, and for those with children who are older than 10, 10 being significant because at that age they are legally responsible for their activities. Um, for parents and carers who have children who are older than 10, I um, can uh, run customised workshops um, to the parents, but crucially I also run whole family workshops which have mum and dad or um, either parent in the same virtual room with the child, having had conversations with the parents to cover the topics that they are concerned about or that they perceive that their children will benefit from. Um, so, and I came because it said social enterprise and um, I am a sole trader. So I was really interested to hear what you said um, earlier about China having um, enterprises that help social causes but are run as businesses because that seems to be quite an, I perceive it, to be quite an alien concept here. So um, I might be doing some research into how China, you know, distills with that whole concept because it seems as though um, it's unusual. Uh, but I, yeah, um, yeah, that's why I'm here. <laughs> One point to pick up, based off what's been said, I guess, the in the UK environment, there is a lot of focus on legal form. So you mentioned sole trader, you know, a, a for-profit business. Um, kicks China just having a regular business. So if you just take that out of the UK context, right? Um, and so let's not deal with legal form. If you're running um, a business like you, Andrew, at the back, where it's around child safety online, it's a social purpose. In some countries, that's considered social enterprise. In a lot of countries, that's considered social enterprise. Um, with your business, you know, you were mentioning you run a source business, but it gives a portion of its profits to a charity in Africa. In a lot of contexts, that's a social enterprise. Um, and even in the context that you were talking about in China, you know, where they're doing a lot of social good, a lot around like employability, or you know, they start a business and it's in a place where a lot of people in that area don't have access to jobs. And they say, look, we'll employ the local community. That's also considered a social, business, social enterprise. Because mm -hmm. it's about what, what good is it bringing to the community? What you're saying is, you know, you're donating a percentage of profits. You're providing a job opportunities for the local community. You're providing a service to ultimately users right back there that children. Um, so the, the, the confusion stems from defining what a social enterprise is um, and sadly I don't have great answers <laughs> from, from my perspective but I guess part of the part of that all stems from in the UK context um, how we fund businesses um, and a lot of that is you know um, that there's a lot bound up in that because there's a lot of grant funding. Um, and grant funding, when that comes down to it, it there, there's, a, there's a, 
scarceness of actually wanting to graft on something that could result in profit. Um, but if you take that away from that, you know, if you went to a commercial investor and you said, these, these are the propositions that we have, they would say, oh, wow, well, that's a really impactful business. Um, so that, I just want to put that out there. I'm just that saying the complexity of the, the UK system of focusing on legal form has its own barriers, but that shouldn't stop someone from considering themselves a social entrepreneur or running a social enterprise. Mm -hmm. It might have complexities when you're thinking about, okay, where can I get funding? Um, or where can I get investment from? That's, that's slightly separate, but it, it should impact your identity as a, uh, if you believe that you know, you're a social entrepreneur, um, you're, the legal form of your business doesn't need to be bound up in it. That, that's my perspective and I appreciate as a grant funder, we add to the complexity of the landscape, but I just wanted to put that out there. I don't know, Ed, you might have a, a completely different viewpoint, but. Not at all, no, I, I was gonna make a similar point. I, I, I think the UK system is dysfunctional for that very reason. Um, and, and we have debates in Bristol quite a lot about this. So I'm completely and utterly agnostic personally about the legal form. Um, what, I, what I'm more, I suppose, interested in is the ability to generate either a revenue or a profit, because that then is an enterprise model. So, you know, the, the source business that donates to uh, the, the charity, when combined, definitely a social enterprise. The reduction in isolation service, poten potentially a social enterprise, but potentially a charity. I would say. In other words, I, I don't. You know, who, who would be the who would be the revenue generating customer, or is it a donation based model? I don't know, know enough about it. But I, it's the it's the it's the ability to generate revenue that is the is is, is the differentiator for me. Um, and, and, and my view is what we should be doing in, in Bristol, at least, is trying to influence that uh, to the maximum extent. So, you know, Andy is a representative of a very forward-thinking grant funder, I would say. Um, not just because I want more money <laughs> off him. But, <laughs> but, you know, quite seriously, we, we've had a lot of debates over the last sort of two or three years where... Um, you know, see if you agree with this, where we brought specific examples of things that are not necessarily fully asset locked. So what I mean by that is it's not a charity or a CIC, it's a normal limited by shares company structure. Yeah. Um, and we, we have found a, a way that we can make that work with a funding model, because actually the, the, the problem that that enterprise is solving is a, is a social problem, and it is an enterprise model. It doesn't happen. Now, with sole traders, it's a slightly different debate again, but you know, what, what you've described is definitely a social enterprise, I would say, with probably a huge market. I'm thinking about, when can I come and see you and talk about my five-year-old son, right? So, <laughs> you know, what, what, what are the rates? So, you know, there, there's a social enterprise there, um, but yeah, I. I suppose I'm just supporting your point and probably taking it a step further that I, I think the UK market needs to forget about legal structures and just think about trading models and purpose. Fantastic. Shall I open it to that room? The lack of legal landscape and legislation around social enterprise, the lack of definition and everything that you're talking about there, is the reason why they struggle to get finance. Because there is that lack of recognition of what they are and who they are um, in in the investment world and in the banking world. You know, they, 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 there's there's a lack of recognition there of what is this business and how do I possibly fund this? You know, from a bank, for example. And I wondered if you thought that obviously that's a very different context and perhaps a, a, a less developed context in terms of social enterprise. But do you think that's still an issue here? for social enterprises to deal with here, in terms of getting access to funding? Yes, I would say. But speaking from direct experience about raising money ourselves, the advice I always get when, when we are trying to go and raise money is, you don't want people to ask too many questions. And as it, uh, because often people, banks, you know, are made up of people, 
will think in a certain sort of fairly fixed way that they've, they've understood from their experience. And therefore, if you, if you present something that has too many sort of unusual aspects to it, it, it distracts from actually the, the core of the proposition, which is we're trying to solve an issue and we've got a, a trading model. So you're a community interest company, what's that? Why, why are you doing that? Um, there, there is a, there's a sort of, I suppose there's, a, there's another thing which might be worth mentioning, which is just the concept of trust. Because I think so much of the investment landscape is basically, you know, underpinned by trust. People do business with people. Um, and I suppose related to that, maybe, I don't know enough about the, the market you, you're studying, is if there's not a sort of, some sort of well-known corporate structure, can't trust it. And I think the same would apply in the UK as well, in the sense that, you know, you, you, you need possibly some sort of co corporate structure that is known and trusted through, you know, in the case here, the English legal system, and that's likely to remove some of those questions. So there's a couple of things that in, in play there. One is the sort of, from my experience recently, don't get too many questions raised about unusual things because it will distract. And the second is just structures that people kind of know and trust. So I don't know if that relates to your market or not. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'd probably add to that. Um, so yeah, in some contexts, not having the definition of charities, kicks, all of that, basically just means when you come to an investor, be that a funder, be that a social investor, be that a commercial investor, they go, okay, my kid says, where are you getting the money from? How much profit are you going to generate? And then the doing good part is up to them how much they wait. So if they're a funder, the doing good part has to be there and all the rest is there. If they're a commercial investor, you know, it's all about profit, not, not about doing good. But there's nothing to worry about legal form. You just come as an organisation and they fund you as that is. Um, coming back to the, what you raised around Cape, Cape Town, and yeah, I'm, I'm not familiar that much with the specifics, but I guess what I would surmise, as Ed says, you know, the similarities here in the fact that it's gonna, if they're an early stage business, they're gonna be high risk. And so straight away, that, that's going to like, close off some doors to a lot of people because they say, this is too high risk for us. Um, and that would even be the same in the UK context. Even if you have the legal form up and running or you know, you're know registered as a charity, you still come and you say, can, you, can I take on investment for my idea? If it's really early stage, people are still going to say no. What starts to change is I guess in the UK context where there's a little bit more leeway is where you're set up as a charity or as a kick or as a, as a social enterprise, but I say social enterprise with quotation marks because there isn't a unified understanding of what social enterprise is. You, know, there, there isn't, you can get a social enterprise mark or you can get traded by different bodies, but there's no global certification that this is a social enterprise because it's a very complex, complex solution, uh, complex problem. Just veering off to the side, um, Pret a Manger, um, yeah. you know, big sandwich chain shop, could consider itself a social enterprise. It generates quite huge profits, but um, it feeds the homeless, it specializes in recruiting workers from marginalized backgrounds, ex-offenders, things. And so, you know, it's not, it's not something they showcase, but it's part of their business model. Yeah. Um, and yeah, but they don't have a social enterprise mark as far as I'm aware of, whatever. So it just highlights the, the lack of understanding across the whole sector about what a social enterprise is. Um, but cu coming back <laughs> full circle to, in the UK context, what makes access to finance potentially slightly easier is when you're approaching a social investor or a fun grant fund and you say, look, I've got quite an early stage high risk proposition here, but I'm asset locked, as I was saying, as a charitable status, then the grant fund is gonna go, potentially, I'll give you some money to try this idea, because even if it all goes wrong, you're not gonna profit from that. And 
honestly, as a grant funder, sometimes that is the biggest concern you have. You know, you, ideally, you want to give money to people because you think they're going to really do good with it. But sometimes the bigger worry is, well, what if they do bad with it? Um, and so, I mean, that, that's a lot to unpack, <laughs> probably for another session. So, um, But that's maybe where there's a little bit more ease of access in a regulated market like the UK for some high risk funding. But, but a lot of that would echo, you know, with high, just high risk early stage businesses in a Cape Town context or a, a Bristol context. Yeah, I, I, I think something that, that, that I, I think within the social enterprise space um, is really about reach, uh, uh, network and communication, right? Because someone may have uh, they may have identified a, a national problem that they're trying to solve. They know that there's a trade market to that, but then they don't actually have the reach to some of those decision makers or funders that would help to scale this micro problem to address a national issue, right? Um, and therefore that lack of finance or that lack of uh, acceleration in terms of uh, scaling up social enterprises to move uh, that blended finance model of, yes, there's something that they've piloted at this stage with a grant or before grants themselves do their own lived experience, they've piloted that, they've actually got this. Now they're looking for some seed funding to, to move it from here. And actually, if they get a contract or you know get a partnership with the council to do X, Y, and Z, they'll, they'll, they'll be at scale. We're not seeing that acceleration and therefore the, the, the reach of social enterprises to have social economic um, impact is quite low. Um, and then B, in terms of network, whether you don't have that access to a network, uh, that even makes it even further away to access opportunities of scaling. Um, the closest network one could say is the family network, right? So if, you're, if in your family there isn't a lawyer, there isn't an accountant, there isn't a banker, uh, there isn't whatever, there isn't some academic achievement within your, your, your household, then you're already at a disadvantage because in order for you to get this network, you have to pay for it. Or you need to invest your time in mentoring or workshops or programs as opposed to someone who's got that internally. So that network also then really has a huge impact. And uh, as you heard from that lady in terms of, you know, the, the network that she had, uh, or rather her communication ability because she used to be part of this health program. She knew how to market the campaign well enough that it could get wide reach into communities, right? You saw the same thing here when it was locked down. You know, Banksy wanted to sell some shirts and it's Banksy. So he's selling some shirts locked down. Everyone is queuing up and, you know, stores are all full, there's queues, everywhere and they all wanted to buy a Banksy shirt, right? We can put a Black History Month shirt out there because people will say Black History Month should be all year round. You think there'll be a queue for it? Definitely not, right? So these factors are the things that really are in the hindrance of making social enterprises be more visible and also to be able to move and work at scale compared to what we are hearing um, uh, uh, in, in, in Australia because there you can see how government is supporting social enterprises. Uh, you can see how corporates are supporting social enterprises. You can see then how they also have an equalities focus on the social enterprise because when they talk about abridging, it's a similar concept that was here in terms of positive action. So when they're looking at who they source uh, procurement from, they're thinking, well, abridging, abridging, abridging. And that element then actually increases equality, it, incre it, it spreads economic wealth, it does all of those things automatically because you've got those that have got the strongest buying power have made those thought conscious decisions that that's what they're going to do and therefore you can see how Australia is so advanced in, how, in the social enterprise landscape. I've always looked at Australia for understanding social enterprises because they do you can think of any sector, they've got it at scale doing social enterprise compared to what we've got here. Um, so I, 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 I think those, that whole concussion of stuff make it really challenging for minority-led uh, entrepreneurs 
who are trying to scale a social enterprise to actually access that opportunity of doing that. First, we literally just don't see one. Then uh, that's what I see is the, the value that someone like Flax Out West Network brings in that terms of bringing a network for people that don't have those existing networks. And I'm, I don't know how long it will take to change the system, but at least it's the start of seeing something where you know, the, a network gets set up to encourage other black led businesses to come together um, to form part of those networks where they might not have been otherwise. Yeah. Um, and I think you know, maybe, yeah, I, I echo, you know, I don't think we're anywhere where we need to be, um, especially when it comes to scaling up contracts as yep. well, um, and access to supply chains, I think it's, has been, a, has been an issue from austerity, even through, you know, talking to housing associations, we have the Social Value Act, yep. but that doesn't seem to have really doesn't seem to have moved, much. moved much, exactly. Yep. Um, and at the moment, when, it, when we talk about Procurement, big supplies, price is always winning. Right? Yeah. At the moment, price is always winning. And ultimately, sometimes it costs more to do something that's actually best for the world. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And that's the thing. And until some businesses and you know, local authorities and housing associations and big suppliers start changing and saying, okay, actually, we're starting to do bad by not making those conscious social decisions. Mm. You know, so we'll, well, hopefully we'll start seeing it with bigger awareness of climate change and climate conscious decisions where actually <coughs> businesses can't just go, right, well, you know, we're not, we're not doing harm by buying, you know, shipping, or flying things over from thousands of miles away because it's a lot cheaper than trying to source it locally. Actually, when you start saying, well, actually, there's a big carbon impact from that. Yeah. And yes, you might be saving yourself your bottom dollar, but actually, you're harming the world, and ultimately, your shareholders are part of this world. I mean, and, I, it, and there's a social enterprise that just sent a proposal with a similar idea. Maybe we could scale that up. Yeah. You know, I, I, I think that's where you're not seeing. We are not seeing that transformational and intentional um, uh, uh, thought process between a funder, uh, public sector, and social investment. You know, to actually, but in the tech sector, we see this. This happens pretty easy when it comes to the tech sector. You know, in terms of then getting those angel investors and and really moving from uh, prototype to scale and being bought by Apple or whatever, we see that very quickly in some sectors. So I think that it is it is there. It is just not there on the sector that are trying to do social and positive good. We still are working in a very uh, um, profit driven society that intends or has got a good intention of being good, but it, it, it doesn't actually do that. When, when we look at the numbers, it doesn't yet do that. It's growing, but it, it, it's, not, it's not there much. Anyway. Can, can you be saying that, I'm just thinking, because you mentioned it there, you know, if you present something to somebody which is more complex than they used to be, then they might not buy it. And what you're, what you're saying, if you went to a large manufacturer, say, and as a social enterprise, delivering a product or a service to that organization, further down the line, somebody's got to make a decision that they're going to, they're going to enable something to come into their supply chain that is not normal. <laughs> uh, and they're taking a significant risk because if it goes wrong, for whatever reason, somebody's going to point up in the corporate ladder that why did you employ a black lad CIC to do <laughs> to do that when you had this mm -hmm. company, you know, uh, traditional structure, um, working with some other or, uh, you know, kind of businesses within the supply chain. That, that's quite yeah, that's a that's a mindset change. I mean I personally I think I, I think that the way to tell a story is to stop business case and then talk about moral imperative that would be my my view yeah I, th I think um, I'm a pragmatist you've got to work with what you got and what you got is fundamentally as, as you said 
to this system. Yeah. And therefore, what is the business case? And I, I think the business case is, um, I, I think it can be done at equivalent cost, would be my view. So imagine if you're going to a, I don't know, a, a council procurement department or a university procurement department or yeah. a business buyer, we can match the cost. Okay, fine, but you're more risk. Well, actually, no, hang on, let's think about this. Yeah. What, what's the bigger risk? Is it, is it the, the single point of failure, big corporate that doesn't actually understand what, it, what is needed on the ground? Or actually, could it, could it be better to have a, a, a portfolio approach to social enterprises who understand what's needed, who actually, if one goes down, goes under, goes bankrupt, actually it's not going to pull the whole ship down because actually you've got a portfolio. So for me, it's about you know, that market-based approach where you can start to create a, a more resilient offer there's a similar price and a lower risk to the buyers, but Sibs, I believe you're right. The only way you're going to do that is by <coughs> starting to actually start mapping the sort of social networks. Yeah. How how is it then you're going to create that market-based solution? And I suppose you know I agree with Andy. That is that is a role that BSW is I think starting to play to say right. Well, if these five social enterprises are going to get the, the business of these big buyers. Yeah. They need to speak to Jane Doe or Joe Bloggs. Yeah. Right, who, who knows Jane Doe or Joe Doe, Doe Bloggs? We don't. How are we going to get there? And I think it needs to be that sort of analytical, data led process that maps social networks and starts like really forensically getting into them. One, one thing I would say as well, though, is just to market something that is available. There is a pro bono offer in Bristol now. So, yeah. some, one of the other barriers. Yeah. So, one of those barriers you talked about, which is basically. Uh, you, I think you were saying that so I don't have access to, you know, uncle, aunt, yeah, cousin, yeah. with the, the sort of free legal IT finance marketing service. That that is an offer that's available in Bristol now, where essentially, if, if there's a very clear ask from a social enterprise that says, "I need marketing skills," yeah, I need finance or legal, I haven't got it. There is the ability to get that at least asked for and provided for free. What people need is a heat map. So when Weka, for example, gives out certain grants, let's see who got the grants. Because Arts Council does provide that data so you can see who's won. Yeah. Because when I, I mean, if we're going to work with 180 businesses and 60 of those uh, are eligible for a particular fund, we work with the 60 and the 60 apply. I speak to 60 businesses and 60 businesses didn't get it. I'm very interested about who did get it, right? But then we don't get that. Another fund comes out. Oh, I applied to this. Another, come on, right? And if we're not seeing the businesses succeed and move forward, then A, we start questioning our business support. You know, but actually, if the funders open up their pot and say, no, this is ring fenced, or this hasn't actually gone, let's look at our data. And we, I think personally, it's things are just getting to that extent. But thank goodness, we, we, we did a, um, a program with Bristol Council and uh, Clinical Commission Group focus on adult, adult social care uh, and with NHS and all that stuff, make it work. Through that program, uh, that, was, that was a specific program looking at adult social care. And that program started off with about eight businesses. And in the end, we had like 20. And from those businesses, at least half of them have now won contracts. So a specific, a specific program focused on a specific thing with a commitment from public sector, NHS commitment to diversify the supply chain. And once the grant process, uh, the contract process started and then we applied, we could see the win, you know? So I think that is a very intentional thing. And we need more of those kind of intentional things that, that kind of works. But had something like that also linked up with uh, BBRC and, and, uh, and LAP then you'd have seen some of those businesses because now the problem that they're in, right, is, is a beautiful struggle. They wanted to get into the procurement, now they're in the procurement. When they're in the procurement, they want the contracts, they win the contracts. Now they want the contracts to, to provide uh, uh, housing support for people with, with different needs, now they don't have the houses. Right? Now they don't have the houses. So now what do they need to do? They're renting, and whoever's charging the, the rent and providing the house is charging the rent at super high. So are they actually now able to make a profit anymore? No. Right? So that's where I think like blended finance, all of this with someone who's trying to scale actually meets them just before they fall and continues them and puts them on a different pivot. 
and that's really important. And and like oh, oh she's not here. Um, most people get caught up, as you were saying, about the, the business model because I think that the, 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 the power that's put on constitution, most people don't focus on it. You know, they don't focus on the, uh, the limited by share company with no share dividend that's you know, donated back to the company. That could be also a social, uh, a social enterprise that could be funded through some of the programs. They don't think about that. It's only just CIC. So maybe there's more education that needs to go into that. Well, thank you so much um, for both your time and a really, I think, thorough assessment of the opportunities within the social enterprise space, the, the role and the importance of social investors like yourself. And what I would say is we talked about constitution, we've talked about what's the right form of constitution, um, we've kind of educated you a little bit around um, the role of social investors and that that is a really, really strong route to start to consider rather than just go to straight grants or, you know, well, city council will do this or can get some even quartet or whatever, you know, to actually look at that sort of blended finance model because that may enable you to scale quicker and it may be that the relationship that you can have with your social lender is, is, is far stronger than some of the other you know kind of options so again Sibs and I are here for anybody who needs our support and help um, with their business uh, or with some of those decisions and uh, thank you again uh, so much to the panel and uh, also thank you to these really bright university you know, <laughs> you know, students who are going to be our next generation I'm sure of uh, high tech yeah. kind of gazelle type social entrepreneurs <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, so yes, yeah, thank you everybody, I hope you found it useful.